Happy Sunday, guys. Happy hey, holidays. Happy holidays, guys, and happy uh, new year upcoming. Yeah, by the time you guys see this video, it may not be 2021 yet, so hopefully you're enjoying the end of what's been a pretty interesting 2020. But today we have a little bit of a different video for you. Next week we'll get back into our adventures, which we are currently filming and currently enjoying. Um, but this week we are going to share with you a recent interview we did with the Wagoner Guide team. Yeah, for those of you that don't know what the Wagoner Guide is, it's a cruising guide that's written on a lot of the favorite anchorages and marinas in the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, and Southeast Alaska. They also have organized flotillas for people that can travel up to Southeast Alaska in the summer in an uh, organized group. So if that's something that interests you, check them out. Yeah, and we talk everything from, you know, how we got started with YouTube to future cruising plans to Dino. <laughs> Sean addresses the Dino Gate saga, <laughs> if you have seen that. Um, but anyway, we just wanted to let you know we hope you guys are having a great end of the year, and we look forward to seeing you guys in 2021. So, Take see you later. Take it easy, guys. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Elizabeth and Sean, come on, save us. Come on uh, down. There they are. Oh, oh, <laughs> whoa. We, changed. we, we weren't going to let Leonard be the only festive one, so we yeah, put on our hats. Very good. <laughs> We uh, we did a no, little pre-show. We didn't get the memo on that. <laughs> well, we, we 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 were yeah. Leonard started this, and yeah. anyway, uh, I want to introduce Elizabeth and Sean from Motor Vessel Freedom. If you haven't seen their YouTube videos, take a look. Not right now. Wait till after the show. But they <laughs> have done a fantastic job, and there's a number of cruising couples that have done these incredible YouTube channels. And some of them, you can tell, their entire career is entertaining a YouTube channel. And I, I will say there's a difference though. The other ones, Sailing Doodles and some of the others are typically in a beautiful tropical location <laughs> with warm blue water, jumping off the boat into this. And Elizabeth and Sean decided to do the Pacific Northwest. So it's got the beauty, but not so much swimming in the water. And we'll talk about that a little later on. Uh, but uh, uh, they do a fantastic job. And, and you watch these shows and you just think they're living the dream. And they are. Uh, they keep, you keep your boat at Shoal Shoal, right? If you're not out on the water. And Sean is working. Well, you're both working full time. But Sean somehow... Uh, Sean, you must have the most incredible boss. I hope he or she <laughs> does not watch your show. <laughs> Hopefully not. You, you know Hopefully what, not. You know what's surprising enough, and nobody's, maybe someone just has seen it and hasn't said anything, but I work in a company of about 1,500 people, and there hasn't been a single person approach me that said they've seen us on YouTube. So it's the big well, secret. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll keep your secret out here. Well, when the Seattle Boat Show Live might just crack open that entire nut there. That's so it, might. Right. it might. It might. So, um, and we do have Midwestern uh, uh, viewers. Uh, Peter's mother is, is watching every week from, you know, the show me state of Missouri. Did I get that right now? Got it. I could, yeah, it's only taken us 28 episodes, but you nailed it, Mark. Uh, it's not the thank landing. You. <laughs> thank you. And uh, she's on every, uh, every Thursday night for us. And, and she sends comments in, and we appreciate that. Uh, we're glad to have some representation from the Midwest. Uh, Elizabeth and Sean located here from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which, uh, as I was sharing with them earlier, is my hometown where I was born and lived till I was 10 years old and learned how to boat on the lakes of Wisconsin, as Elizabeth and Sean did. And uh, how did you pick the Northwest? What, what was the big draw? Well, if we're being completely honest, it was like 2013, 2012, when the Fifty Shades books were huge. <laughs> and oh. I, hadn't, I hadn't read them, but everybody I knew had been reading them and people were going to Seattle to visit. I guess there were Fifty Shades tours you could do. And after like a year of seeing all of these people posting on Facebook, these beautiful pictures of Seattle, I asked Sean, I said, for my birthday, next year, which was 2013 at the time. I said, let's do a long weekend um, in Seattle and see what it's all about. Because I grew up thinking it rained here all the time. Um, I had never seen mountains before. 
So we just decided to come for the weekend and it was October and it was 70 and sunny the whole time. And we boated in the morning or we, we skied in the morning and boated in the afternoon and just totally fell in love. And we said, okay, let's come back in the winter and you know see what it's like in the winter. So we came back in January of 2014. Um, and we didn't know at the time we booked it, but it was Super Bowl Sunday when the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. So we were at our Remember hotel. Well. Yeah. We were at our hotel watching the Super Bowl and we were just like, God, this this feels like it could be home someday. Um, because we always thought and we we wanted to boat year round and we thought Florida would be the place for that, but we never felt like Florida could be home. It just didn't feel right. Um, so we decided, we said, okay, if, if the Seahawks win the Super Bowl, that's a sign that we're going to move here. And I told Sean, I said, I've already changed jobs once in my life. You're going to find a job out here. And uh, the, the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. I ended up finding a job. And by April 30th, we had moved out here. And at the time you owned a boat in Milwaukee, I believe, and you yep. brought it out here. Is that correct? What kind of boat did you start with? We did, yeah. So I mean, this is our fourth boat. Uh, the boat that we moved out here was our second boat. It was a Carver 360 sport sedan, which was uh, quite an endeavor to get it out here just because it's a bridge boat, so it's very tall. Um, I had to it, disconnect everything and hire a crane to lift the bridge off and put the two sections on a truck. And I don't know, I think we spent $15,000 or something to have a truck bring it out here and we dropped it off at CSR and they helped me put the boat back together. So that's the boat that we moved out here and, and now we're on to boat four. Once we were here, um, the Carver was a lot of fun. We enjoyed it for about a year. Uh, we've been out here for a little over six years. So we've had the Carver for about a year and then we bought a, a Sea Ray Sundancer, 40 foot Sundancer. And we had that boat and enjoyed, it, it really enjoyed the boat. We went circumnavigated Vancouver Island. We really kind of went everywhere with it. But then we knew that, you know, it just wasn't the long-term boat that, that we wanted and have the range and the capability that we wanted in a boat. And, and, and we were looking at trawlers and that's how we ended up with the Nordhaven. Before you moved out here, had you done much kind of big water sort of boating or were you more into lake boating? It all, I mean, the Great Lakes, which, which is big water. Yeah. I mean, inside, uh, you know, the protected waters of Puget Sound, we have found to be easier boating than, than the Great Lakes by far. Um, the Great Lakes, you got to watch out for weather systems in, in the summer and they can kick up some pretty nasty seas and waves on pretty short periods. Uh, probably some of the scariest wet seas we've been in yeah. have been on, on the Great Lakes. Um, certainly we've been in some nasty stuff out here as well, but, but nothing they're like nothing to mess with. Yeah, they're big, big water. Right on. So what were your first impressions? Did you go up to the San Juan Islands and look around and go, oh, this is okay? Or what was it? You know, at the time when we were in Milwaukee, we were watching um, some YouTube channels. Uh, oh, yeah. The, boat, the boat guy? The boat, the, the oh, chip boat an hour. guy, Chip Hour. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, uh, Pacific Northwest Boater. Yeah. And they had a lot of episodes on the San Juans. And I think one of the first places after we had the boat put yeah. back together and splashed in the water here uh, was going up to Lopez Island. We went to Spencer Spit and, and that was yeah one of our first destinations. Yeah. Wow. And now uh, I've been following your YouTube channel and you've made it to quite a few locations and uh, you've even gone down on the coast uh, and down into uh, up the Columbia River, which uh, kudos to you for doing the Columbia Bar. That's fantastic. And, yeah, and I love your explanations of it, of explaining the pros and cons and all together, uh, you, you, don't, you don't sugarcoat it too much you point out where some of these challenges are. How did you feel going up the, uh, the, uh, over the bar uh, at, on the Columbia? You know, we got so lucky. The weather was so good. Our worst experience was the Westport bar. Um, we weren't expecting it to be bad. We, I don't know, we misread the forecast, um, but we had probably eight to 10 foot waves going, leaving Westport on our way to Oregon. Um, so that when you're not ready for it, it was pretty scary when, you know, the whole boat just is, is moving in directions you didn't think it could move in. Um, but then, <laughs> good way to put it. Yeah. Um, but the Columbia bar, we were mentally prepared. I mean, that was one of the things that we, that was scaring us about going into Oregon in the first place and going to Astoria. 
So we had for several months been just reading up and preparing. And then we got there and it was flat seas and, and really good. So we got lucky. Um, but then we went to the Maritime Museum in Astoria and got totally freaked out again because it's all about the Columbia Bar and the deaths that have happened there and the cargo ships and all the ships that have sunk trying to cross. So it's, it's not anything to just think you're gonna cross easily. Uh, a good weather window is always the, uh, the answer. And uh, <laughs> as Leonard and Lorena can point out, they've got some stories of their own because uh, they've been down to Mexico and up to Alaska. And uh, we've all had uh, some interesting uh, character building experiences is what I like to call them. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Oh, character yeah, yeah. building. <laughs> it's good yeah. enough. You know, before we went to Oregon, Sean didn't really want to go. He, we only had two weeks to take off and um, he was just a little bummed thinking about all, of, you know, spending a lot of that two weeks doing something that was, that needed our attention the whole two weeks where we couldn't just go to the San Juans and kind of know that it's going to be smooth sailing the whole time. Um, and I really wanted to push us to do something scary because, you know, I said, we're always in calm waters. We're always taking the easy road. Let's, let's do it and see how we do. And it was good to experience it and know like every time you experience something new like that or push yourself to do um, a different body of water and in different conditions, especially overnight, you just feel better and you, you want to go farther. Yeah. And how about up in this area, the San Juans, and I'll even throw it out there, Rosario Strait can be one of the scariest places in this immediate area. And have you had any tough experiences in the San Juans or areas north where you've gone? Not so much the San Juans, no. um, probably the Strait of Juan de Fuca going, yeah. you know, west out to the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, last year, we had some pretty nasty seas and we had to we had to duck in but and there's not a lot of places to to do so um but it, just the strait not 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 in the islands and rosario strait we, we haven't really had any issues in, in those areas yeah. so what what started you documenting this for a youtube channel uh you know I, I, as we know from doing this show every week and from doing other uh things that we do at the wagner guide once you start, you got to feed the beast. And you guys are now doing a weekly show. You've got to come up with all kinds of storylines. And I'll talk about that in a few moments. But how did that all start? Yeah, and it's true. I, this year, we've gotten lucky where we've just, we've had enough to share every week. Um, we don't put pressure on ourselves to just throw stuff out there if it's not, if it's, if it's, if we're just trying to like force a video, but there's just a lot, especially when you live on a boat, there's just always something to share we've been finding. Um, but I think our, you know, we used to watch, like I'm sure you guys did or do too, um, Delos, SV Delos. Yes. yes. And he was, they were one of the first channels um, we started watching, I think even back in Wisconsin. And what I really liked about um, that channel was it, it wasn't, and no offense to any other channel, but it wasn't like a 20 year old who had just graduated from college, who was just sailing around the world. It was a guy who worked at Microsoft, who was a corporate guy, who I felt like I could relate to him that, you know, you're in your thirties and you feel like you want to do something else with your life. Um, and to watch him do it and give it all up and go sail around the world was really inspiring. So we always thought, well, as we got more and more into the idea of wanting to travel the world, especially you know, on our boat, um, we thought, well, maybe a YouTube channel could help us fund that at some point. And, um, but none of, neither one of us had ever made a video. And one night I saw Sean tinkering with an editing software and it looked crazy. I was like, there's no way we could ever make a video <laughs> and do this YouTube thing. Um, and then a couple months went by. It's kind of a funny story because um, at the time I worked in technology for um, Nordstrom in Seattle. And we had to do project presentations. And one of the teams did this amazing video. And I went up to the project manager after and I said, how did you make your video? It was so professionally done. And he said, oh, my 11 year old did it on iMovie on her iPad. And I came home and I, I said, okay, we're gonna try to make a video. Like it's probably not that hard. And we just went out with our dog Sandy one day on the boat and made a video and, and found it to be really fun and a good way to not only document our travels because those types of videos are what inspired us to move out here in the first place um 
but it kind of just snowballed and it's been five years now that it's, it's just kind of grew and grew and grew. And I really enjoy it, uh, making the videos and it's, it's kind of cool to see where it, it can go. And, you know, you don't make a ton of money on YouTube, but it, it can be something so that when we do start cruising full time, um, we're not completely broke. So your goal is to, to basically create this YouTube channel to a point that it can fund your lifestyle. To a point, to a point that it can pay some of the bills. I don't know if it'll ever get to a point where it could fund everything. And, you know, that's why we're not doing it full time. We, we still work or Sean still has the traditional full time job. Um, but the hope is at some point it can help us extend our savings for beyond what we have now. Good way to put it. Um, uh, and how many people are now watching your channel? We have about almost 26,000 subscribers, which is crazy. Yeah, crazy. that is. It's a few more than us, Mark. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that, that's why I invited them on. Exactly, I, I you're thought, not dummy. We can, we can bring our numbers up. The old way. piggyback. I like that, Bunzel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and I have a question. To stay organized, were there books that you read or you'd recommend how to pare down, how to stay organized, minimalism, anything in that regard that's helped you to kind of get rid of some of the stuff that we don't need so much? We've always lived in really small spaces. I mean, we've never, we've always lived in apartments um, or condos. We live, we've lived in cities in Milwaukee and in Seattle. So we've never, I guess, been used to, you know, having a ton of space. Um, and then while we were here, we lived in four different places and each move that we made, uh, you know, we were continually downsizing and our last place was a studio apartment uh, downtown. It was about 550 square feet. Um, you know, it had kind of a galley kitchen and, and the bedroom was just partitioned off with kind of a glass wall to the rest of the place. And our boat is, we figured it out one day. We think it's about 400 square feet. But it honestly feels bigger than than our last studio, just because the, the way the space is laid out and the fact that it has sort of two separate uh, state rooms and, and, and that heads. So for us, it wasn't it really wasn't a big challenge. And we knew that when we moved down to the boat, we didn't want to have storage units. So if it didn't fit on the boat, um, we needed to make decisions about what to do with that stuff. Yeah. Also, I, I didn't read the Marie Kondo book, but I've heard a ton about it. And um, some old colleagues of mine, since I worked in retail and I was for a while in inventory management. Um, one of my uh, VPs always talked about that book and she always said, Does, is this bringing our customers joy? Like, is this bringing you joy in your life? And I always thought for the, like the last year before we moved aboard the boat full time, I always thought of that. Like every, every time I go into the closet, if I saw things that I hadn't worn in six, even six months, if there were kitchen appliances, we had over each move, we would donate and get rid of so much stuff. And it, I think it helps to move frequently because you see all the things that you have that you don't even use. And it, it started to just make us annoyed with ourselves. Like, why do we have all this stuff that we're not even touching? Even last night, I, when we were doing our dishes, I said, look around, we still have so much that we don't even touch. So you just have to be realistic and take a hard look at all the things you have and, and a, assess what do you what do you what brings you joy and what doesn't what i love is you don't have a lawnmower I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, no i i don't either i live in a, a, a townhouse but uh, uh the whole idea of not having the responsibility of dealing with what's outside and, and sean you put a lot of tender loving care into freedom i mean i, I if i understand right your biggest joy in the world is getting out there and waxing and polishing. <laughs> Probably. Freedom. No, you know, I like, uh, I like tinkering. I have a hard time sitting still. Um, and, and I have a hard time, uh, you know, there's a lot of great people out in the marine industry that'll take care of work for you if you don't want to do it yourself. But I have a hard time, you know, paying people to do things that, you know, maybe we could do ourselves and, 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 say, and you can save a fair bit of money, you know, if you do learn how to do a lot of those things yourselves, whether it's you know, simple stuff like waxing the boat or changing the fluids and in, in the engine. Um, I wouldn't say I love it, but you know, it's it, it, it's all right. Yeah. Well, and we've well, had we've had friends over the years who you know who boated with us before, especially in Milwaukee, that they they boated with us and had boats, and they also had the home and the cars and the, the kids, and and you know, I guess just the home and the cars are what's relevant, but 
they were so stressed out having to deal with both and having to always come to the marina to clean the boat on a on the weekend and then go mow the lawn and i just thought it, it, we just we love boating like this just is, is what we do we don't take a lot of vacations like everything is on the water for us so we don't we weren't trading off like oh we have to go and wax or oh we have to go and clean and then go mow the lawn so it, it would be hard if you had to deal with all of that well, let's talk about that for a second, because I was really impressed in one of your recent episodes about a month ago, where, Sean, you dug into the cooling system of your gen set, your Northern Lights gen set. And I thought, I wonder how many people are out there in the audience thinking, and did you encourage them that they could do it? Because what Sean did is he took apart the whole cooling system, sent parts off to the radiator shop to, to be redone. And wrapped his body around this because like most boats uh, it's not the easiest to get to but uh, what are your limits Sean how far will you go on the repairs uh, I don't you know just about everything one thing that's nice about this boat is it, it's very simple um, you know the the engine's a fully mechanical diesel it's, it doesn't have a electronic fuel injection and you know an ECU it's all mechanical fuel pumps so, it, so it's pretty simple um, you know, some boats are, are, are much more complex. If you get a boat nowadays with IPS on it, um, you know, or any pod drive system, those are you know probably things I wouldn't tinker with, but that's what I like about this boat is I, I, nothing feels, I guess, outside of, uh, of my limits of maybe what I could learn if I don't know it already. And there's lots of avenues for people that want to learn it, you know, whether it's attending different seminars at a boat show, ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Or or, uh, or different books, or in our case, you know, we have a Northern Lights generator, and they're right here in Seattle, and I, I took a, a class there for three days with Logger Bob, and he'll get you educated on on the generator, and he'll teach you how to do anything that you want to, anything that you want to know about it. So, you know, there's a lot of avenues for people to get smarter about their boats and their systems, if, if that's something that they're interested in. Well, well, I, have, I have a question for you. Let Leonard jump in. Yeah, uh, so a question about, uh, you. I see you use a drone a bit, is that right? We do, uh, yeah. Can you, can you tell or talk about some of the experiences? We just started using the drone and uh, ran into some very interesting things like uh, like the retar return to home feature on the drone and home used to be back over there about a mile or so. Uh, any kind of experiences like that? How, are, and how many drones have you been through or are you still on the original one? <laughs> So we, we, we've been through uh, two drones. Uh, one, one. Pilot Air. One, one we lost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, we've learned quite a bit. So I mean, when, we're, when we fly it from the boat, we, we, take, we take off the drone from our hand and we retrieve it um, from our hand as well. We don't try to land it on the boat while it's moving. Honestly, the, the drones nowadays, they have more and more like collision avoidance sensors, which makes it uh, more difficult. <laughs> To, to land it on the boat because the minute you start bringing it close to yourself, the drone wants to either, you know, fly the other way to stay away from you because, you know, you're getting too close to it. So one thing that I found is a lot of the remotes nowadays, they have a switch where you can turn it into sport mode. And when you turn it into sport mode, it disables a lot of those collision avoidance sensors. So we'll bring the boat to, you know, kind of a dead, you know, dead still if we can, or just, you know, slow idle and I'll fly the drone as close to the boat as I can with, with the sensors enabled. And then when I get really close to myself, I'll use one hand and I'll switch the remote over to sport mode to turn all the sensors off. And then I'll reach out and, and grab it. And when the sensors are off, then the drone won't want to try to fly away from me. But the, the other thing you need to be aware of is well, when you take the drone off, the, the takeoff point is usually the return to home point and it calculates its battery based on how long it takes to get back to that point. So if you're having it follow you for, for several minutes, you're obviously getting further and further away from, from that point. And at some point the drone's gonna say, I gotta go back to home because it's you know three miles <laughs> uh, back from, from where I launched it. So um, either need to force a new home position or just you know cancel the return to home and override it and manually fly it back to yourself. Yeah, but also maybe wear gloves sometimes when Sean's grabbing it, I'm watching at the helm and I'm like cringing, waiting for like a finger to get dinged. So be careful. That is the other big problem. They're, the drones keep getting smaller and smaller. So there's nothing good to grab on them. The old drones had the big landing gears on the bottom and, you know, something easy to just take your arm and go and grab it out of the sky. So what, what drone do you have now? What do you use? 
We have a, a Mavic Mini and a Mavic 2. And the Mavic Mini is the entry level drone. It's from DJI. It's you know the least expensive drone that they offer. And honestly, it's it's like a go-to drone for us. We love the way it flies. You don't feel too bad if if you do end up uh, you know losing it. And it has all the bells and whistles is is pretty much as what the larger drones do. So I highly recommend it for anybody that's you know wants to get their first drone and learn how to fly and get some shots of their boat. Yeah. And I think in some of your credits, you've said that Elizabeth is often drone pilot also. I'm the remote pilot in command. So I have to be around when he's flying it. Usually it's Sean flying it. Um, I don't have the guts to fly it over water. <laughs> she's the she's the credentialed uh, drone yeah. pilot between the two of us. But I, I'm usually the one flying it and she just tells me what to do. Yeah, I'm the warden <laughs> that says, no, we can't fly here. No, you can't go over there. No, you can't go over people. No, you got to come home. <laughs> got it. Got it. Before we move away from your maintenance, I, I, I want to give you credit, Sean. I was totaling up how much money you saved doing that maintenance on your gen set that you spent the better part of a day. And I know what a mechanic costs. And you got right in there and, and we're able to, and, you know, being liveaboards, I, I know saving money like that. I mean, that was a $2,500 day. Yeah. It was two days. I think, yeah, right? easily. I mean, between part markup and labor, you know, I'm sure any mechanic is between 100 and 150 bucks an hour. So you have someone on yeah. your boat for a day, it's a thousand or 1500 bucks. And there's been a lot of jobs. It, like I said, we haven't um, had a mechanic do anything on our boat since we've owned it other than, other than bottom paint. Um, only because a lot of the yards don't don't want you to do that yourself. Uh, but, but otherwise, everything we've done ourselves, we, we had to change a muffler on this boat with, as a dry stack exhaust, which wasn't a fun job at all. It was really messy and it had to be uh, cut out and wrestled out of the boat. So that was something I did myself. Uh, you know, I, I adjust the valves on the engines and I did maintenance on the stabilizer. So it installed new appliances and electronics on the boat. So we tackled a lot of different projects and I would think, you know, over the years, we've probably on average saved ten to $15,000 a year by, by tackling all those jobs ourselves. And did you have training before this? I'm glad you mentioned the Northern Lights training program, because I know that's an outstanding class. Even if you don't buy a Northern Lights, they, he just teaches so much of the basics. But did you have other mechanical training? Yeah, nothing uh, specific to nothing specific to boat maintenance. I, I run a, um, a company where I lead a team of engineers, we design and build factory automation. So assembly equipment and inspection and packaging equipment. So I, you know, by nature, I'm surrounded by mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, machine builders. Um, my background is, is, is a tool and die maker. Uh, I work in the plastics industry is kind of what our parent company is. So I've always been a hands-on mechanical type of person. Well, uh, my hat goes off to you. I. I as I said, I count the amount of money you've, you've saved uh, and uh, uh, more power to you. You've inspired me to do more on my boat, which is going to be an absolute disaster when I do that. But uh, yeah. I'll, I'll let you know yeah. if anything blows up. We have a big winter of projects coming. So you'll probably, if you like the project videos, you'll probably like <laughs> this winter. Well, I like the mixture of what you do. And, and Elizabeth, you've done some great cooking things shown some things and, and you have uh, an onboard tester who gives you <laughs> feedback immediately. And uh, uh, I, I love the way you balance it for a cruising couple. Uh, now, one episode that I- Oh I boy, oh boy. Is, <laughs> is uh, there was a recent episode about Christmas decorations oh, on your Nordhaven. Okay. <laughs> oh brother. You can see uh, they're, they're up, right? Oh, they're yeah. over here. You can. Yeah. The dinosaur is still on the bow. Well, the dinosaur had to come down this week with the high winds, but he'll he'll yeah. go back up as soon as the weather forecast yeah. improves. Sean saved his life by taking him I down. Did. <laughs> I probably should have left them up, and I would have taken care of them. But <laughs> well, yeah, the the part where where Elizabeth, you described that Sean didn't like the lights you put up. He couldn't take them down. So we went through and started clipping them to cutting them. I mean, I, 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 I felt your pain for both yeah, of you. That, that, that was a shocker. And, you know, I told him last year, because the Seattle, last year was the first time we had seen the Seattle Christmas boat parade. 
through mm-hmm. Elliott Bay. And we had been to Polsbo and we saw the parade. And for a long time, I've always said, like, I would love to decorate one of our boats. And last year I said, if next year we're living aboard and the boat is our home, we are definitely de- decorating the boat. And he said, no, you're not. <laughs> So it's well, not like he was warned. He was warned. He was warned. And and uh, just spoiler alert to people watching, because I hope you look at the episode. <laughs> but Elizabeth wisely waited for Sean to go out of town on a business trip. And then she did all of this. And more power to you. You climbed all over that boat. I, I <laughs> applaud you for that. And she had the boat fully decorated. And Sean came back after a, an airline flight, I assume, from the Midwest. Yeah. And... Uh, and he was visibly cranky. And here I'm watching, and here is the couple that have the dream life. And all of a sudden, they're cranky. And we're going to cut the <laughs> decorations down. And I thought, oh, my God, I hope they stay together after this episode. So it was, it was great realism and great television. And, and Sean, you get an Academy Award for your crankiness. Uh, yeah. So the yeah. part of the story that wasn't told is, you know, I was flying home that no, night. I and, told it. Uh, well, Elizabeth usually picks me up from 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 the airport, and that night I don't I think she was worried about Dino flying away in the wind. So you know, I'm on the plane and I was connected to Wi-Fi, and she sends me a message. She says the truck won't start. You're, you know, you're gonna have to Uber or find your way home. And the next day we were planning to take the boat out. It was the, the weekend before Thanksgiving. I had the week off, and we were gonna go up to the San Juans. And I'm, I'm like, oh great, now I got to deal with you know, the truck not starting. So I was cranky about that. And, and then I got in the boat and I was in the pilot house and it was windy that night. And I hear this, this clanging and I look out the hatch in the pilot house and the lights that were strung up, the strong arms are no. slapping against the strong arms. I'm like, lights got to go. So I clipped them <laughs> and pulled them down. And, she didn't but it's all good. They've part. thrown on me and they're back up. They were not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to see well, what next did. Christmas happen, what happens. I next Christmas. I'm, I'm worried. He's not going to leave <laughs> town. <laughs> I have a question. Looking back in the transition to living on the boat, what's the single best piece of advice you received? That we received? Yeah. About how to make it work? We didn't receive any advice. Um, I guess, you know, some friends of ours, um, they have a blog, Red Rover. They, we met them. It was funny. We met them through our real estate agent when we were selling our condo to buy our boat. Um, They have a 55 Nordhaven. So before we bought Freedom, we met them and went on their boat and um, they both worked and still do work and travel. And I was just really curious about, you know, how did you leave? You know, they had the house and um, they have a couple kids that are now grown up, but I was curious, like, just how do you, you know, what do you guys miss and, and how was the transition for you? And they were basically like, we wish we would have done this sooner. We love it. Um, they love the freedom of it. Uh, kind of being free of all the stuff like we've talked about and um, now they're cruising now they're in Mexico so nice Leonard Lorena did you have any trouble with the transition because you did the same thing you moved from beautiful home in in Juanita and onto the boat and then going off to Mexico did we lived aboard for seven years absolutely loved it I think you meet, it's easy to meet your neighbors, right? You're out walking on the dock and you meet so many people and people are more outgoing, more friendly. Uh, You just have a great time meeting people. You can move your home, which is your boat, wherever you want to. And that was fabulous. Uh, We kept some things and did put them in storage, uh, but we lived on the boat for seven years. And so, yeah, it was nice not to have a lot of stuff for a while. And that uh, it was uh, for our phase of life, which was downsizing uh, time, uh, getting rid of the stuff. You know, you, you talked about that, uh, you two, and, and not having very much stuff. And after a lifetime of a family and so on, you accumulate a lot of stuff. And it was a good experience to do that, to get rid of that stuff. And Lorena's all, always one. She's very neat and tidy and doesn't keep anything that's not being used or active or or purposeful, uh, which, by the way, is the reason that I stay active all the time. Because <laughs> if I'm not active and, per- and useful, I'm out. You know, the, <laughs> the, the weekly pickup is gone. Leonard's gone. I worry about that. that <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, she's no. she's very neat, very organized. So it was a little easier for us because she was very good, very organized, and, and had everything pared down before we did that. But 
We absolutely love the liverwort. You talked about it. I, I, I was smiling a little bit when you were talking about how, you know, everything in the 400 square feet. I did the same calculation on our boat and came up <laughs> with a number that was almost identical to yours. Sure. And uh, it's just, it's wonderful. It also saves money in the, in the shopping spree. She's a shopper too. Like to and shop. so, so <laughs> when you're on a boat, everything she looks at, you say, where are you going to put that? Yeah. 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 Where are you going to put that? <laughs> I'm not a big shopper, but I love watching home shows. Like I love um, Home and Garden Network where they, you know, the, the, the even million dollar listing that show and real estate. And there are a lot, there are some times where I'll watch some of those shows and you see these beautiful homes being built and you, you stop for a second and you're like, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have that, <laughs> that beautiful kitchen and wow, look at, they have a movie theater. <laughs> um, but then we always stop, or at least I always stop and think if you're landlocked, like, what are you going to do? You, I love being able to move your home. So, if, you know, there'll come a point where we leave Seattle and we go south and go north. And it's nice to know that when you get the itch to change up your scenery, it's it's a lot easier to just take your home versus having to sell a home and buy a new one and, and uproot that way. We just can take, we can have all of our, the comforts of our home. Like we have our Christmas tree up right now and we're gonna move it in a few days. And um, when we had, when we lived on land and we'd um, go see our family for the holidays, we never had a Christmas tree because we thought, well, we're never gonna be there. Um, we're going to leave our home and go to someone else's home. Now it's nice to know that even if we go out of town, we're still in our home. Yeah. So you, you got fresh eyes to this area, relatively fresh eyes. What's your favorite? What have you found that just blew you away that you can want to go back to or, or tell all your friends about what's been your favorite? You go first. Oh, <laughs> well, geez. I, I mean, obviously I think Susha is a, probably a favorite for just about everybody that certainly ranks high with us. Um, we've really got to like liking uh, Orcas Island, East and West Sound. Um, yeah. Just to, to not a lot of people go there besides going to like Rosario or sort of a North Marina. So it's nice to anchor in some of those bays and often have them to yourselves. Um, so those have become a new favorite for us this year. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. The, when I, when I think of like, where I really want to go, even before COVID, during COVID, hopefully after COVID, is Tofino, British Columbia. Mm. Um, I, I mean, this area is amazing, but something about British Columbia is just extra magical. Um, and when we circumnavigated in our sea ray, just that whole west coast of the island is is awesome, and I can't wait to get back there, hopefully sooner rather than later. And then you know the Broughtons are amazing. You just you get into these little marinas and you look up and there's huge mountains and there's bears and it's, it's pretty awesome. But yeah. Tofino's, Tofino's awesome. I'll add to that. And Leonard Lorena and I have been talking about this lately and that's Haida Gwaii. And uh, yeah. I, I don't know whether you've had a chance to get up there yet, but uh -huh. it's, it's another one of those incredibly special places. And we'll have to dedicate a show one night to Haida Gwaii because not a lot of people go there because they're scared and uh, uh, of the crossing of Hecate Strait. But, uh, you know, it, it's watching the weather window. I, I got lucky and it was pretty flat going across and then uh, uh, flat coming back. And uh, other people have had another experience doing it. So, uh, so we'll have to save that one up. But, well, Fina's uh, got the nice uh, hot springs also in that area and certainly yeah, yeah, a lot, yeah. of, lot to and offer it, there. Yeah. What are your favorite uh, boating apps that you swear by? Navionics. Yeah, Navionics um, for weather. Sail flow is certainly one that we look at frequently as well as like windy and predict wind. Um, but th that's probably about it. Uh-huh. And so. in your weather preparation, and you've done some great, you know, your trip down the coast was interesting to see how you prepared and everything. Uh, what, uh, how do you put together your weather plan for a passage? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 we look for light winds. I'm not particularly concerned with maybe the direction of the wind, but more obviously the velocity of the wind. So, you know, generally if it's going to be sustained winds over 15 or 20 knots, um, you know, we'll probably look to wait things out. 
because uh, likely in our experience, it seems like it's always higher um, than what it predicts. It's rarely, you know, lower. Uh, yeah, what they predict. I agree. So, for for us, you know, that that's huge. Obviously, on the West Coast, you're in, uh, you know, you're out in the open ocean, so you can't just be looking in the areas local to where you're going to bow, but you need to, you need to zoom out a bit and see, you know, what are the different fronts coming through and, and the winds offshore, because obviously waves will build and they'll carry a, a very long distance. Um, so it's, it's important to not just look at your immediate surroundings, but, you know, take a little bit wider view and, and uh, use that as part of your planning. Good. Good. And uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's on your agenda for, what's your short uh, list of uh, places to go? That you want to go. What do you mean by short list? <laughs> <laughs> short list. Yeah, well, How far north do you want to go? Or what are your plans for, for continuing northward? Yeah, we just solidified some plans yesterday. Um, we ultimately want to get up to Anchorage and get into Prince William Sound and just do all of Alaska, Southeast, all the way up. Um, with Sean's work, it may not happen this year in 2021. So we might actually go South for a year and spend some time in the Bay Area, cruising from San Francisco up to Sacramento and maybe into the Stockton area that I we've been hearing more about that it's got some pretty interesting spots. Um, Sean's itching for warm weather. I'm fine here, but we might take a year and uh, do some California cruising and then come back up here and then head north um, in 2022. Yeah, be careful what you wish for in the Stockton area. The Delta can get uh, really warm, and yeah. uh, but, uh, but it is great cruising down there. Yeah, we're thinking maybe starting in the Bay Area and then, you know, the, uh, the live aboard is still difficult in California too. So we might have to do, you know, 60 or 90 days in a place and then move south for another 60 or 90 days. Um, yeah. As long as Sean's near an airport, we could maybe make a year out of seeing all of California. And then we've checked that off the list. So next stop would be Alaska and not sure where we go after Alaska. Maybe the Northwest Passage if we have the guts to do it or, or go back through Mexico and the canal and into the Caribbean. Have you thought about taking the Nordhaven across the Atlantic? Yeah. Yeah, we have. Uh -huh. yeah. I think there's yeah, a... I think definitely. But, that's that's our, when we um, get into Mexico, that's the plan to go through the canal, into the Caribbean, and then up on the east coast of the U.S., and then over to um, Scandinavian area. Boy, I agree with that plan. That's <laughs> sounds fantastic. It's a little with us easier. traveling with uh, with a dog as well, it's easier. In the South Pacific, just a lot of countries require quarantine of the dog, and um, just seems like a. There's Mr. Sully. There's Mr. Sully. <laughs> uh, you just for heard everybody you. else who have, hasn't seen their channel. Mr. Sully gets top top billing, uh, right at the he front does. of the show. <laughs> And uh, uh, you guys do a great job in taking care of it. Is Eddie in the picture here? Okay, the Landons, and I, I teased them last week. Oh. There we go. There is Eddie. Oh. There. What is he? Oh, they're on mute. There they are. He's a, he's a doc. doc Only doc. about four months old, so he's. <laughs> He so gets very cute. playful in the evening and he tears around and oh plays my god. <laughs> How does he do on the boat? Uh, well, he's new. We had another dachshund. She lived to be nearly 18 years old. Wow. And we had to say goodbye in April. Of course, that made us very sad, so we had to get another. So he will be new to boating. It'll be a new experience for him. <laughs> So the new dog, Eddie's going to have some big, big shoes to fill because our previous dog, Java, she was a very good boat dog. We even had, had a picture of her on that when we were headed down the coast and, uh, and we were heeled over and, and we have this picture of her in a companion way. And the companion way is about like this and she's standing straight up this way. She's and, leaning on all fours. All fours and <laughs> riding it out. Yeah, so oh, your dog, what your and yours? Your dog is seven and a half. Uh, he's a rescue. We had our, our lab Sandy who 
passed away last December and she was almost 14 and had been voting with us almost her entire life. Um, so luckily we had three years with Sandy showing Sully how to vote and what to do and how to, how to use the pea patch. <laughs> And well, that answers I, that question without asking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. But we used to have a fire hydrant because, you know, Sully being a little boy dog, he just, he took to the fire hydrant and he could pee on something. Um, he would go. And then one night we were in some wake and he knocked the fire hydrant over and forever he's now afraid of the fire hydrant. So <laughs> when we had to get rid of the fire hydrant and now every time we're at anchor, it's, it takes us like a day to get him or two to get him to use it and we force it you know we don't take him to shore we just wait we say okay buddy you're gonna have a stomach ache if you don't go and <laughs> usually by the 24 hour mark um if he does go that long he's usually fine <laughs> so you've got mr sully to help you meet people on the dock have you found that now that you have your youtube channel are are people recognizing you when you're out boating yeah yeah <laughs> How's that been for you to be famous? It's weird. It's really weird. Um, you know, it's funny around Shulshul, we don't, um, not a lot of people come up to us, um, but every time we're cruising outside of um, the Seattle area, someone comes up and everybody's so nice. So it's, yeah. it's nice to meet people. And, you know, before we were, I guess, well known, <laughs> um, you'd go to different ports and I guess you could go out of your way to socialize, but you usually kind of went and we would do our own thing and be on our boat and we didn't get to interact with a lot of people. So it's kind of nice and refreshing, especially nowadays to meet nice people and um, like-minded people that are in the, the boating community and hear their stories of where they're headed. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's an amazing community. And I, I, I boated in different areas of the world and I, I still think the boating community here is better and more friendly than other places. Yeah. yeah. So, Agreed. Uh, now, have you found that people will sometimes follow you the next stop thinking, you know where to go, you know where the good spots are? We have people following the Landons all the time. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. At times, uh, you know, we'll delay post. Um, you know, if we're posting something on Instagram, uh, or we may choose at times to run with our AIS in silent mode. Um, <laughs> a, a few times, but for the most part, you know, people have, have been great. It, it kind of amazed at, you know, how much energy some people put into going out of their way to say nice things. We've had uh, a lady uh, make a blanket for Sally. Yeah. We had a guy make this really oh, yeah. cool, like piece of art with the little Nordhaven and our logo on it. So there's, I don't know, it's, it's been pretty crazy, the outreach of how, how nice some people really are. Yeah. And have you started speaking at yacht clubs? No. No, no. <laughs> I've been asked. Oh, no, be careful. We've been asked, a lot to, we've been asked to join a lot of yacht clubs, but because we're not, we don't see ourselves being here long-term and we're kind of out on our own a lot. Um, and don't like to be tied down to any type of schedule or anything. We just kind of want to keep our schedule as free as possible to just go and, and not be committed to um, a group type thing. We haven't joined. Well, Leonard, Lorena, and I last week spoke at my yacht club, the Anacortes Yacht Club. And this Friday night, tomorrow night, we're at their yacht club. It just worked out that way, the Fidalgo Yacht Club. So, uh, uh, oh, we, I didn't know they. I didn't know either of those places had a yacht club. Yeah, Anacortes has three. Total of three. Three. Yes, and uh, uh, they're, they're, they have slightly different leanings, power versus sail, but uh, good, great group of people at all of them. Yeah, we love Anacortes. A few comments in the chat as we wind down here. Mike, my friend Mike Lockatell says he hopes you get to Holland. Fantastic cruising. Uh, Thatcher was wondering how the comments uh, affected you on the uh, the dinosaur episode. If they affected you at all, he oh, thought it was a it. well done, <laughs> well done show. Um, yeah, people man. bashed me pretty good in, in that. So if you want to go read that, yeah. <laughs> did they really? Oh, yeah. I didn't expect it to be as bad, but I was like, you know, you can't, 
you can't, you rede he redeemed himself, at least to me. He put, <laughs> he fixed the lights. He actually, you know, got his electrical gear out the next morning and fixed them. <laughs> I thought it was well balanced. I thought you did a great job with it. And what I applaud you is that, you know, not every cruise with a cruising couple is, you know, perfect. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, the two of you are with each other all day, 24 seven sometimes. And, and managing a boat, managing a lifestyle, and it's not gonna go perfect at all times. And I thought that was something we could all identify with. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> and where can people I'm find glad you? You're, I'm glad you're still together. I, we're gonna have to have you in separate windows in this show if it did not work. Yeah. Where can people find you? Are you I've, I've posted your website in the chat, but are you on Facebook, uh, Instagram, obviously YouTube, but uh, what are some of the handles that you prefer? Yep, we're on Instagram, so at MB Freedom Seattle, you can find us. Excellent. And Elizabeth, are you going to start publishing some recipes? Uh, Lorena did that in her boating experience with her book series, Cleats and Eats. Uh, not so much recipes, but great places to eat. Uh, will you post some of your recipes? We should. We definitely should. You know, Sean's more of the cook. I like to bake. Um, but I don't do a lot of it these days for whatever reason. But Sean's been like Chef Sean lately. He's been making some pretty good stuff. Go so. for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should. We were talking about maybe putting out like from the galley videos, like every once in a while, like just five minutes of, of some of his good recipes. I, I think you should. I mean, I, I love what you do with your Q&A at the end of the show. I, I think the, the questions are interesting. It's interesting to hear what people ask you. Yeah. And you do a great job of answering them. We, well, we stole about... that idea from Cruising Sea Venture, which is another local uh, boating couple out of Everett. They're now in Alaska for the winter, but they always end their videos with a Q&A. And it's probably the part of the video that I enjoyed the most. I'm like, we need to steal that idea and, and do it as well. Nothing wrong with stealing a good idea. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> a question from Matt Panic: When will the podcast be back? I'm not sure. Uh, that's our podcast. Uh, I, that's a good question. We, we do need to address that in 2021. And I think we're going to start by turning this show into uh, being able that people can experience it on podcast while they're in their car or at work or whatever. 24 7. 24 7. You take over the listen, uh, world, Bunzel. Listen to us blabber on, king of media. <laughs> I've got a podcast. Mark, did you know that? I do. Yeah. I do. I had a big I, interview this past week with the Speaker of the House, Lori Jenkins. I've had Tom Douglas on. It's been a fun, it's no 26,000 folks on YouTube following, I don't think, but oh, it's been a fun venture for 2020. You guys need a YouTube channel and you guys need an Instagram page. I don't think you're on, you're not on Instagram, right? Well, actually, Elizabeth, that's why you're on the show tonight. We actually wanted to yeah, talk to you about Yeah, actually, we, we, <laughs> we are coming up on Instagram, but uh, we do, as of this week, have a YouTube channel. And uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, we're, we're about maxed out with media right now. Yeah, Zuckerberg <laughs> wants a slice and we're just like, hold on, Mark. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, know. <laughs> I know, it's rough. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Yeah, what a, what a great thanks for being to... on the show tonight. Thanks, thanks for having holiday, us. Yeah. You're our holiday treat. Yeah. So. I'm glad we uh, ran and got our hats. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad great. you did also. Uh, thanks, for everybody in the great. audience, we're gonna, we're gonna take a break for two weeks. Peter, you get uh, the next two Thursday nights off, seeing it's Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Uh, good planning on that uh, on that part. And uh, uh, we'll have some great shows starting up on January 7th. And uh, we're going to put together a great schedule for 2021, some great guests. And uh, Sean and Elizabeth, I really would like to have you back at some point. I think it's what you're doing is just fabulous. It's an inspiration. I think mo mo more people should consider doing it. Uh, and you're, you're so realistic about it and a lot of fun. And uh, Elizabeth, I, I know I teased you earlier that I, you know, the other shows all show people diving off their boat into that clear blue Caribbean water. And uh, I, I had a sneak preview. Uh, Elizabeth on her birthday in October decided to show that she could swim in Northwest waters. I, I cringed as she dove off the boat, but she made it, she survived. And she said something tonight before we got started that she, 
She may do this again in January. Yep, the polar plunge is coming to the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> polar plunge, so one of the upcoming shows, maybe we'll see Elizabeth braving the Northwest as only a woman from Wisconsin can do. Yeah, it's actually, it's really not that, you know, if don't, I'm not a doctor, but it's so healthy for you. If you, I've had some back problems in the last couple of years that the minute I go into freezing cold water, it zaps it all away. Uh, so I'm there's, gonna take there's a real good, it. there's a good reason for me jumping in the water. <laughs> as our lawyer would say, please don't take this as a recommendation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is an individual opinion. The producers of the show have nothing to do with recommending that yeah. you jump in. The question is, is, am I going to get Sean in the water for January 1? Uh, we'll to see. I, I'm not going to put money <laughs> on it. <laughs> Cliffhanger. All right, everybody. Yeah, well, so. see, you, see you next year. Uh, fun show tonight. A, a big show tonight. Um, hope you all check out sailorboatshow.com. And, and check out the Wagner. Sponsors, the yeah. Wagner Guide and Gene Grosbeck Realty and Anna Cortez for your waterfront house needs and and uh, oh there there's is. a guy there okay. it is on cue John and Elizabeth to, have one. Uh, use it it was it was so helpful this summer when we went to the south sound for the first time we loved it so thank you guys for sending us a, a new one you know to tell you the truth it was it was good for Leonard Lorena and myself when we went to the south sound because we <laughs> hadn't been there in years and now <laughs> that area has been all updated and and we had a respectively had a great time <laughs> <laughs> great time down there so thank you for bringing that up so all right well, yeah thank the viewers at home episode 29 for us we started this on a lark uh for saturday Night live that was a comedian by the name of steve martin i think i know that name uh might be i've still heard around. of it yes yeah, also a fantastic banjo player and he has a Liechtenstein collection that is world famous as well so multi-talented man yeah uh but as are we so uh there you go we mark try. we'll we see try. you uh we'll see you all next year thanks for watching Good night, Thank everybody. you, everybody. Thanks for your Bye. comments Bye. on the chat line. Have a happy, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Yeah, Good night. Thanks, guys.